Hello everyone, today we talk briefly and introductorily about the infantry organization and arms in early modern warfare. As you know, I have been making uh, quite a consistent amount of videos on modern warfare, but never entered kind of in, in the details of it, especially from a tactical point of view. Strictly speaking, we talk about politics, uh, campaigns sometimes, especially most things revolving around the one of Vienna 1683. Uh, we talked also in part about Prince Eugene and however we stuck mostly to the army organization of the main in fact early modern powers and you know that in this um, group we have basically uh, stretched from Europe to India right and so there is a lot it's about the Ottomans, for example, that surely deserve to be discussed. And there are some countries that we discuss more and others less. For example, we never talk, say, about the German armies this time, or the Spanish armies this time. So there's really a lot to do still. Um, arms and armor also have been discussed, but I plan to introduce quite quickly, quite soon. Um, Actually, a, a modern warfare series more f focused on doctrine and strategy, but especially tactics. That is to say, you know, let's take a look at what was happening, even from from the same field and reading sources about battles, combat in general. And therefore, I think that talking a bit more about modern warfare and trying to be a bit more encyclopedical and complete about it is quite a good idea for this channel. That will hopefully uh, expand uh, this autumn and winter uh, given that um, re there is a momentum here that has uh, increased and it's being sustained so it's very important to exploit and I realize that you like these topics and that you uh, also appreciate whenever there is a bit more of a uh, single but also multiple national flavor right so that you can have a broader comparative uh, outlook on the topic, so this could be also the opening for further modern and even contemporary warfare. Telling the truth, we talked about contemporary armies, even you know the ones of 2022. Um, this year we started that as well. So there is really a lot that I plan to cover because even though starting as a medievalist, just saying okay, w whatever it happens, I, I will never exhaust any basic medieval topic. So I can just um, uh, fill the gaps with that just as I've been doing in the last couple of weeks because I was busy with work um, but just know that there is the, like in terms properly of military history we haven't even started in my opinion to talk seriously and that's also the reason why this channel is uh, sometimes misunderstood at this point simply because I could make really much more about warfare but still I have it but it does require more time because it's more quality content saying more in depth more you know precise information it requires a bit more research but it can be done as you know I never uh, never back down it was never you know discouraged from talking also about you know very picky very pickily about certain things maybe or uh, modern warfare included. So I don't know even why today I'm making this general survey of infantry organization and arms um, in this broader period and phase. We're not in fact as we were saying before just talking about Western warfare but mostly because that's basically um, you know most of the content of course we we can uh, that I can make is derived from the greater documentation that we have for Western warfare so um, there is all a um, general focus placed on Western Europe for obvious reasons however as you know I also try on my channel to cover as I was saying before lots of other um, other peoples and cultures sometimes within the same Europe um, there are certain in fact protagonists that are often not considered and or even if they were maybe objectively less important and still were very important in absolute terms and their military culture was to influence a lot western warfare just think about all that kind of ethnic uh, 
uh, onomastics that was left also in, in style and even in, in year, in appearance, in the, I don't know, in, from, the, from the, well, in fact, exactly these centuries to just categorize more limpidly and homogeneously in the 18th uh, about the Ulans, the Usars, etc. I made a video about that, by the way, because I think that also the anthropological meaning behind certain units and certain fine styles is is crucial, really tells it all, and it helps to substantiate those differences better, right? So that you can have a broader, uh, really a broader picture of the world. Now, uh, we've seen how the end of the 15th century, so today we start from the last decades of, of that, in fact, in the first half of the 16th were a period of consistent experiment. Uh, pr pretty much overlooked if you consider what um, most of early modern warfare's attention really gets to mostly and in fact the pike and shot um, let's say uh, the, the moment of full pike and shot uh, stabilization let's say and the various uh, the, the balance let's say that was gradually shifting between uh, uh, measure between the the pike and the shot, right? And that's in fact what also we mostly discussed. There would be a very interesting digression to make on how we we got there from medieval times, just see, one or two generations before 1500. You have something that looks pretty much that kind of feudal, ultra um, kind of chivalric if you want think about the full plate armor the the, the gothic milanese the the still the, the radical importance of cavalry on the battlefield uh in spite of the idea that, that there was some sort of gradual positivistic teleological uh, and uninterrupted constant increase of infantry um in the from from the from the years before this this is true in a uh, in, in an absolute sense, starting from the again the the second half of the 14th century, but it's very heterogeneous in the various parts of Europe, right? So there is a world that evolves towards this very, you know, this massive, bulky bike and shot formations that are actually fully uh, put in. Uh, in uh, in being by by the Spanish at the beginning of the 16th century that had did take from essentially from the Swiss uh, as far as just basically the the pike was concerned because up to that point as you know the Swiss phalanx had not relied particularly on the shot right and also during the same years of the Italian wars uh, as you know Switzerland uh, actually with great fortune. Uh, for for the for the same country's future respectively was defeated militarily speaking because you know having seized Milan for example would have brought to a completely different Swiss history and probably not to the massive benefits that the Switzerland still enjoys today uh, after her say withdrawal from onwards um, so one would have to explain those passages as well of course, uh, even though, as you know, I'm not a fan nor of modernism in in a strict sense. I mean, not of modernity per se, but of modernism. The so-called uh, the idea of the military revolution, which never existed. Um, and But, uh, of course, I trace quite limpidly, because that's politically and socially the whole military point. The, uh, at, as any other historian at this point, of course, the uh, the development of such armies in the startled development of countries, especially like France, even more Spain, that would pioneer fully that kind of uh, military standard, right? Uninterrupted uh, now from from the beginning of the of the 16th to the to the mid first half at least of the 17th century, uh, because they they had a lot of money. And they had not even a lot of people, right? There were a lot of people all together with, you know, in the broader, um, you know, after the uh, 
dynastic unification of Castilla and Aragon, but it was really a matter of cost, right, and of control, also in very um, rich areas. Right? This is not just the American mines, but uh, countries like uh, Naples or, or Lombardy, and the same Netherlands that, however, as you know, engulfed eventually the, the, whole, the whole empire after after the Italian wars, you have the Eighty Years' War, and that it also intertwines with the Thirty Years' War. So uh, that is the uh, long, uh, very long war that uh, would exhaust finally the the Spanish Empire. Not not even so um, catastrophically in a in a broader historical course. I mean, Spanish uh, Spanish forces could have been employed surely in a different way, but it was mostly a political problem, as always. Um, there is the, Ar the disaster of the Armada as well. Yes, there are all these things, but say Spain goes on, right? And this is often um, uh, overlooked. Uh, we have discussed this aspect also in in those videos about the, uh, let's say, the Protestant military reformers, uh, especially the Dutch and the Swedes with uh, Maurice of Nassau and Gustavus Adolphus as well, that rather than presenting like kind of a most break into some kind of old static tradition. We're just fundamentally riding the wave as victorious countries of what the military potential kind of offer at the time. But other armies, including, for example, the Spanish one, were actually uh, experimenting the same identical things at the same time. And here also there is a lot of problem of documentation. So I, I'm not going... That, 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 that is a problem in, in the measure in which, of course, people do not document themselves rather than, at this point, you really have a lot of information. But modern sources are also many, right, and extremely difficult in this sense to frame altogether. So we have to be um, sometimes just very careful um, and uh, real, let's say, about what we really um, focus on. And more in general, as we were saying before, there is a lot in between, right? Um, and not just pike and shot, in fact, but outside of it. And in times um, such as the same uh, 16th century, um, which, for example, bows in the hands of the missile troops, or as um, English writers tended to call them, the shot in many different shock weapons also kept being used. Of course, bikemen were were equipped still with swords. There were bills, halberds too. This hadn't really disappeared. There were axes um, and more, really. Um, the same pike is something you find in emergential situations, say, hastily and, um, uh, um, say, uh, poorly equipped militia during Napoleonic Wars, yes, were, was equipped with pikes, because still, you know, that's what a collective formation can do, if you lack muskets, and uh, still, you know, the, the weapon is outdated, but you must do something, or uh, which is better than, than nothing, right, so this this is true for many contexts, you know, that the English, for example, remain, remain after the, the Hundred Years' War, uh, relatively isolated, from the, uh, the the rest of the continent, from the continent, if you prefer, uh, and they maintained for a longer time, for example, the use of longbow up to the mid 16th century. But generally speaking, on the continent as well, that's more or less the same timeline for for the crossbow use that keeps being a thing, right? In, even in say relatively advanced contexts, right? Um, and all this, of course, has a, in fact, a context, which is the one that eventually also dictates at some point the, the general abandonment of certain weapons, right? But always reflecting whatever the local political and social possibilities really were to, to materialize from a military point of view. Now, um, by the mid-16th century, some say, best buys in the field of weapons had emerged. And most Western European armies at least settled down to a combination of, of, of pikes and harquebus with um, a gradually increasing proportion of muskets 
among the latter. We, we don't know with clarity from the sources um, often, say, between the, especially in the second half of the 16th century, but also in the early 17th, whether we're really talking about muskets or harquebuses. Right? The pre um vocabulary is not categorical. These weapons were not standardized in the way we, we intend today. Some were probably of different size. The musket had been born as mobile artillery, telling the truth. Um, and in fact, it remained, um, even though you know it was kind of heavier, bulkier, and it's adapted. The men army was much heavier, bulkier, complicated, thrilled, etc. But still, it was much more effective. And this is why, in spite of all these difficulties, at the end of the day, the benefit was greater. And gradually, as you know, musketry expands and dominates, and the arquebuse fell uh, out of use. Even here, you can find very interesting things, like you know, the Celtic fringe uh, being supplied, say, by, I don't know, Papal, uh, Papal guns, because needing, needing them in the first place, because otherwise it would still fight as, as in the Middle Ages, right? And um, this, these are not exaggerations, if you know how still the Highlanders fought. Of course, they knew how perfectly how to use modern weapons that were hired so I made a video in September or, or August exactly pointing at this kind of uh, late medieval and early modern mercenary recruitment pools in Europe all over, in fact, um, the, the hottest, especially in central northern Europe areas, etc. And, um, and so you have there also a, a broader um, merging of Europe from a cultural point of view further into a unique thing because these people brought back also lots of uh, of beliefs that were again repeated in common right around the fires in the bivouacs at night etc and uh, the, the 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 modernization of warfare does pass also through the compaction of a of a European culture that um, is is not really an opinion, especially in a moment in which the, the continent was also gradually taking off, also expanding outside uh, of itself quite, quite consistently, and thanks to these killing machines. Um, so, you know more or less what we're talking about in a standard mid-16th century army. It's fundamentally a massive pike block that is flanked or you know support in, in other more also elaborate articulated ways by by shot units and that fundamentally advances literally as fortresses in the field very slowly supporting each other um, there is a, a cavalry role which never really comes less even though by the mid 16th century you have the, the moment of greatest contraction of cavalry from the Iron Age to the late 19th century and in this context, cavalry mostly skirmishes, right? It, it always charges as well, because that's the primary function, but only after the enemy has been softened up enough. And doctrinally speaking, cavalry was needed, but still the massive pike blocks were, um, were enough to, to fence it off so that infantry was the decisive arm anyway. But still, of course, cavalry charged. It charged also in the pikes because pikes have always been used, and you know that has nothing to do with you know uh, cavalry men charging against uh, them or not. That has to do with the cohesion of, of, of the of the unit, uh, helping to break it. But very often it was just this enormous attritional um, mess, that, which really was decided by the same pikes fight because the shot too until in fact the end of the uh, until its disappearance in the end of the, on the, of the 17th century uh, was not enough of course as light infantry had never been enough and would never be enough even though the concept of light and heavy is relative to the various ages so this could be true in general in any age but in that context the shot per se had never had of course the capacity of stopping 
the packs. In other words, um, the shot could uh, reverse on the enemy, this, this, this uh, continuous fire, but which also, as you know, was very much, um, you know, theorized because it was a complicated thing to do when reloading these weapons, maintaining enough unit uh, order and cohesion, alternating the lines, all these kind of things took time, essentially because of, of the resources that could be put into training, right? Uh, technology basically had barely anything to do with it, proportionally. But what would happen is that that wasn't enough to thin the pike uh, block enough for it to dissolve even when it attacked. It was, still a com it was all a combined arm tactics with cavalry and all. So the shot would have had to retreat in order to give way in the first place. And so at that point, of course, the uh, the pike would gain the ground. So you, you need other pike to stand the ground and then with the shot keeping to um, to harass and to, to deplete also, in fact, the, the enemy manpower until a, a block collapsed and others, you know, and others would retreat and so on. And this, as you know, had brought, I made videos about this, the so-called statis, uh, statisization of warfare that gradually was just you know, um, surpassed throughout, especially the 17th century with, you know, great, in general, this was true probably since the, the end, even the end of, of, of the 16th century, right, it just was not so, um, so strongly evident, especially throughout all the, the timeline of the 30 years war, but th there was already a, a direction that was pushing towards that, you have great theorists such as Montecuccoli that already um, envisaged this necessity of uh, increasing uh, mobility. You have important experiments with uh, the Swedish cavalry against an anachronism of success such as the Polish Hussars, right? And there you realize that Poland, and we made several videos about that, had a different army because it was coping with different political, strategical uh, situations compared to their her western neighbors right because otherwise Poland at the end of the Middle Ages was basically identical in, in arms and armor to 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 any other western country except they had eventually to re-easternize due to the uh, the the threats posed by the, her eastern neighbors and more anything if anything just maybe because of her expansion in the east rather but uh, with the consolidation of the, the Confederacy with Lithuania and so on, it shifted the, um, the, the balance east and so on. Uh, so, as always, um, everyone fights with what, what you have, and if you can adapt, the better, right? And war hybridizes dramatically. But at the same time, uh, there are some, some things that you can use to, to balance out, right? It, we have seen this often. Um, in the Ottoman w warfare videos, where the Ottomans have a, a, an importantly different military um, culture than the, the Westerners, but they perform also dramatically well, in some cases also better, in fact, um, than, than the Christians, and there were plenty of Christians telling the truth in, in Ottoman armies, but I'm talking about the Westerners, and, and, and they, they counterbalance each other, throughout all this time, uh, and um, for example, the Ottomans had, on average, less heavy cavalry than the West, so that the average Western cavalry was superior to the Ottomans, but the same Westerners said that the elite Ottoman cavalry was superior to theirs, however, the Ottomans didn't really have uh, much of a stopping power, they didn't have much pike, right, for political, social reasons, they didn't have the same middle classes that Western Europe had, uh, nor in in Rumelia, nor in, in Anatolia, uh, wherever they would recruit their troops, uh, but they had uh, lots of lighter uh, skirmishing cavalry from the various tributary peoples, also the, the, the Tartars and so on, which the Westerners, generally speaking, didn't have. So, um, uh, you had the Janissaries, they're essentially stormtroopers, and they are really impressive, as you know, the Ottomans dominate firearms technology because fundamentally from the granulation of power to the um, to the invention of the bayonet uh, 
uh, the the Ottoman that there's not any other major change that that occurs uh, after the Battle of Magersdorf, um, Saint Gothard, where you want to call it, after having seized the Ottoman camp, the uh, the Imperial Field Marshal Montecuccoli checked the the gunpowder barrels uh, of the enemy and said, you know, this is excellent, excellent powder. And that is what actually made greatly the um, the quality of the firing performance of arms at the time. Um, there are many other interesting things. We know Europeans were impressed quite early on by Ottoman snipers in during the, 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 the very big... Uh, amount of siege warfare that was ongoing in the Mediterranean with the various fortresses in the islands, all this logistics problem. There is all the something we never discussed, if not briefly about Venice or something, about the, the Armata Grossa and the Armata Sottile. Um, but about naval warfare, made something about um, Barbarossa, for example, um, the um, some other say broader naval issues. We never talk about the War of Crete, the War of Candia, or the Battle of Lepanto, for example, but there we are at very big levels. And naval battles, of course, just like in antiquity and in uh, modern times were were rare, right? Um, naval potential was pretty limited in this uh, in this age, but still it was dramatically important for supporting, of course, land operations. Uh, and so there, there is, there, there would be so much to tell, and perhaps this is an idea for another, for another series because that's a very overlooked side of, of the story. Um, and um, and more, right? There is all the issues of uh, economic interdependence, for example, lots, but I mean, really lots of Western um, arms and technology were sold uh, off very very cheaply to the Ottomans at the end of the Thirty Years' War because simply Europe had had a crisis of overproduction of military armament after that massive uh, conflict. And so um, everything is really more blurred than it really, really seems. Um, but as you understand, the more we drive away from, from Western Europe and the the more different the type of warfare really is. Mm -hmm. uh, we never talk about Native American warfare, which is very interesting. Right? Native Americans were very quick at getting their hands on anything the Europeans really had in terms of arms, armor, um, you know. And there are impressive uh, Battle accounts. Some some conquistadores wrote at a point against in South uh, in South America that the the Indians had uh, you know the the order in the battle line that the Landsknechten had in the empire. And this is extraordinary because they, these are the same people in practice that fought uh, in the, all these corners of the globe. So um, they knew better really what war was about, and there you always realize how cultures adapt to crisis and are able to um, to count right and there was a lot that the Spanish had to to do before subduing certain peoples even uh, in the Americas um, but again it's not a technological issue either it's mostly a much broader one now the Let's say by the early 17th century, the musket had taken over. Mm. The pike and musket ruled the, the battlefield at that point um, until in the second half of the same century, the development of the bayonet, as we were saying before, uh, by making it possible for the musketeer to defend himself against cavalry because there was enough firepower and, you know, that could be combined with just essentially a, a blade a place on, on the top of the musket, uh, m made, at that point, the pike redundant. And also other 
other arms that had still existed up to that point. The the halberd, for example, had been in use up to you know long after the, the mid 16th century. Um, as always. Um, there, there is a bit of a cliche that is usually repeated, that is to say that, that pitch battles were rare, right? Um, first of all, pitch battles, here you should even define what, what you mean by it in terms of size mostly, of engagement, because there is no such thing like a, a strict category between, you know, a pitch battle and any other kind of engagement that can break out and even trigger basically a pitch battle, as it often happened, even though you know, most most of warfare revolved around of the major engagements revolved, of course, around sieges, as always, right? So there was an army besieging uh, a stronghold, that, uh, and uh, a relief army would, would arrive to to try to force the block, and pitch battles were fought. But there was uh, th they were much more frequent than they seem, and also. So the also the doctrinal problems were posed much more frequently than we think, and also there was of course a lot of other operations that are of course overlooked because they are less strategically relevant, but at the same time made up yes the majority of engagements, right? So this is true also for the Middle Ages. Whoever told you I can tell you because that what I study basically my life is studying medieval battles specifically, and I can tell you that pitch battles in the Middle Ages weren't rare at all, right? They were actually rather frequent, um, and basically any campaign would would escalate uh, to the point of at least the possibility of triggering one. Um, but, and of course, there, there is a lot of other clashes, but when you realize these other lesser clashes, very often uh, you realize that there were pitch battles, smaller ones, mini pitch battles, the, but were fought that way, and they just maybe were not documented enough. They don't think that you know in the modern age is much better documented when we talk about, especially about battle accounts compared to the Middle Ages. Very often, telling the truth, the Renaissance um, authors were were also more detached from from the battlefields, especially in the early humanistic phase, than uh, some medieval chroniclers, for example, in the centuries before really were. So, frankly, the humanistic accounts are pretty boring, um, and they don't tell that much. I, mean, I made a video about the Battle of the Molinella, for example, and I, uh, having studied mostly, you know, army, um, I mean, battles of, of one century before, I must say that there had been a, a dramatic drop in the quality of the sources there, uh, for obvious reasons, because at that point the middle classes had fundamentally disappeared, or at least you know there were, but they didn't have so much control, like in the past, um, and uh, the same troopers were just like um, they're just just like in ancient Greece. They were all proletarians, right? In in ancient Greece, you have the classical phase where there are still the the citizen soldier, let's say, that fights and writes the accounts. Right, and so we know much more about the political warfare than we have about, let's say, the the Macedonian phalanx later on, because the Macedonian phalanges were just essentially uh, the dispossessed scum of the earth who didn't know how to read or write; it just went at war, and it, it, the the world was ruled by by warlords uh, that were essentially monarchs, emperors, and so nobody. The same goes for Rome, practically. Right, r with the exception that Rome, generally speaking, wasn't even coming from a from a particularly literate background before, so it was more more, more like a kind of a barbarian power, and then came to rule the world with, with an elite, and it never had anything. Fortunately, also for the this human civilization of demo democratic as as you would intend, um, and um, it, today at least, and so. We have described the kind of the anthropological type of an early modern soldier, but even of an officer, uh, of a captain. We have made that video about the Spanish rogue. We have seen uh, well lots of interesting thing under that point of view, and and you know the the misery, of course, that that warfare really was at the time. Also, it was a business fundamentally. You know how the, uh, the 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 commission officers speculated, in fact, on the commissions 
and how much the quality of, of the army was, you know, uh, the, um, you know, diluted in, in the process. But it was also a political problem. It was at the top, you know, the mon monarchies and states the basically function in the same way. So everything had to consolidate further. And uh, warfare was deeply affected th by this because when you start reading military treatises that start to come around uh, this time, you realize that they're very idealistic, that the same people like Maurice of Nassau, etc., that were actually, you know, big successful generals and quite experienced ones, um, and so quite capable ones as, uh, as a consequence, would write treatises in, in a very idealized way. It's not that they thought that what they were describing was reality, it was, was kind of a sort of, you know, renaissance obsession for the for the classical world um, and uh, it was just expressing a need for rationalization of course it was some kind of attempt of positive application on the same but as we, we, we explained in the Clausewitzian um, theory playlist um, that was just again very distant from from having any kind of scientific description of what the battlefield really were in fact as I also explained in those videos about the Dutch and the Swedish armies, um, the also all the this is normal really in history. All the at, um, the, the the attributions, like the the attributed innovations to single uh, military reformers, are actually a myth. I mean, these individuals didn't really introduce anything new. It was already there, and or also after them wasn't absolutely a, a standard for those things to be there. Um, but again, people kind of believe in that, right? This is start for every single reformer. Basically, you realize they didn't invent anything new because armies already developed on their own. They're always different. They always have to adapt to do, to to different challenges. Um, and just there is kind of an idea that under a glorious uh, general or successful ruler, there is this great, um, you know, theoretical genius behind it really no right the, the, and that this is the problem of the concept of the military revolution there wasn't any revolution it took um essentially uh, almost half of a millennium before before f firearms took over ever since gunpowder was introduced for for military for military terms so if you call that revolution which is not even a revolution technically because there is not a course which is inverted even etymologically uh well, I don't know what the hell does that that means, if not fireworks for making people selling books that are also frankly garbage or almost. And and so um this is a deeply rooted problem that the 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 sooner we eradicate for the nonsense that it is and the much better we will uh under uh, say the much sooner we will also understand we will improve our understanding of military history uh, so there was naturally a gradual standar standardization appearing in the field of organization at the end of which is also a great part of the issue and you can understand there what was the sustainability of this military system if the this dispositions come to you know closer to, to the results fundamentally or the latter at least to the former at the end of the 15th century armies were composed of feudal levies fundamentally or of mercenaries which were by that point the same thing in a sense because all feudal levies were paid so there wasn't any special favor that one would make to someone wanting to call them up even when there was a very strong political cooperation you needed to sustain those costs and that's why in fact the modern state is so important um, and in, and so ever more spending and you know and shaping itself essentially for war because that's essentially what states at the time pre-industrial times really really spent most of their resources for um, and all these troops in fact were organized in at least usually in companies that was pretty much a standard thing or bands at least or uh, sometimes 
of non-standard size and for combat these were usually formed temporarily in three large battles that is to say uh, battle lines right originally the van the main battle and and the rear this is what exists standardly uh, since the 13th century at the latest onwards right that is to say essentially the early modern organization is is a medieval one and that's basically it like if, if depended on me in terms of of didactic approximations it would erase the concept of modern era because what we're seeing is basically a medieval civilization um, until the, the, the big break is done with the contemporary era so the uh, so the called Napoleon and, and and so the state as single source of law and all what it follows also in the military organization and that tells you which power state reached uh, uh, as like in in this day uh, we're still in it so but we're talking about an ancien regime system right it, it is true of course especially in the second modern age there is a lot of um, say statal in fact uh, power increase in that sense it was all again if you look at the rise of Austria or of Prussia you realize that it's all about that it's all about essentially dispensing the local communities from billeting in exchange for a tax and so that's how taxes are born like in a, in a statistic sense uh, so that the state could maintain soldiers in their own in the statal barracks this is basically the core of all you remember in school that chapter in the history books about the uh, the, the, the the rise of, of, of states the, the age of enlightenment the enlightened reforms well that's basically exclusively that right there is not other you know the, the rest ex outside of the military realm is just a contour of that um, and it's it, this should make us understand much more also what our civilization concretely is right because culturalism will tell you that barbarians make war and civilized peoples don't absolutely not uh, civilization the greatest the civilization the greatest the destructive power that it has right and the greatest the, the responsibility that and the the education that it requires right so um, refusing to use violence also to tame the violence of the lesser cultures is a form of civilizational weakness there is nothing to be proud of right not to make war um, for the good reasons and this this aspect was evident enough at the time given that basically all these politics were in a sense a step away from from annihilation and so there was a frenetic work that also brings to for example the same development of diplomacy in a permanent professional sense as we were saying before the deep the deep um, let's say compaction of probably a European civilization and and more really. in this thing of the van the main battle and rare it's again it's basically the same medieval army there and unavoidably and much distortion exists also ideologically in this the early 16th century was still but also you know the early 17th for that matter was still an age of, of, of mercenaries right within the with the Landsknecht and fighting uh, against the the same Holy Roman Empire at a point think about all the wars um, the peasant war uh, the the Schmalzkalt League and and, um, and more all the, the issues of course following from the Protestant uh, reform uh, but you have, for example, a Catholic axis that is somewhat overlooked. Um, Italians helping to crush Catholic rebels in England, things like these, and so on. And and this remained true later, as we were remembering before. It, there was a great mobility. Uh, there were lots of people going uh, everywhere. Uh, even the the famous, uh, the infamous today, Zaporizia, for example, was C of of a of an island of pirates of cossacks that basically was formed this come of old west like you know criminals political exiles 
uh, religious persecutors, they just went there and they raided around and this kind of things. And again, you know what's, what's mercenarism about, generally speaking, Western civilization, you think that it's something bad. Machiavelli kind of expressed this quite powerfully. Then the 19th century and uh, nationalism and romanticism re-emphasized this idea that if you essentially, you know, fight for some or for a power that is not your own, there's something wrong. As if, by the way, you know, there weren't enough reasons to to fight against sometimes your own country, right? Uh, through resistance to tyranny and this kind of thing. So. Um, that's a pretty hypocritical concept and also because at the time everybody was paid practically in the same way so while it is obvious that mercenaries were very often wild and brutal the other side of the coin is that this mostly happened because at a certain point when they were used and the by by a certain polity this wouldn't pay them and so they would be let on out on their own you see that there weren't barracks there weren't places were to were to billet them without in fact getting from you know extracting exacting resources from the local population so massacres such as the one of Antwerp or uh, of Magdeburg or more right you know and the, all the brutality especially in, in I don't know if you've ever read uh, Simplicius Simplicissimus by uh, Grimmelshausen well that opens your eyes about Germany in the Thirty Years' War and the, the, the scale of violence and, and, and misery and, and destruction that, that really was. Um, well, th this was pretty normal in many contexts. Like, I, I've studied too much medieval history not to know, for example, those Carolingian capitularies that said to the army, the same Carolingian army that was crossing friendly lands, you know, when land approaches, or Easter, uh, you know, d don't um, avoid to, you know, rape women and to to set churches on fire because, you know, that's really not nice. Well, when it's, it's distant from land time, well, it kind of be, but say, let's not make God too angry. Because at the end of the day, uh, most human beings are scumbag, and if we also stopped pretending that, that the common people are good people in general, we would also perhaps live in a much better world um, so the w when we look at, at these realities of course you realize that of course there could be a much greater problem in in handling a thing like war uh, independently from from this meaning that you know same reason why you hire mercenaries is that even if they are the better option and very often in fact they were Right. Uh, also, because they were professionals, um, there is here also in the more civilized um, countries, let's say, a, a tendency to gentrification. To the in fact, the more power to these public institutions, and you know, this this is reflected to the uh, the general rationalization and organization and increasing power and so on, and incidentally the the improvement also of of the countries living standards so be very careful in connecting some kind of direct proportionality between you know the expansion of of central power and the one of individual freedom because actually um, historically it's the other way around if you don't have that you just leave um, you know shooting at, at your neighbor and nobody really being able to prevent any of this so there is always a balance to keep and not just an extremism to pick. Uh, now, um, there, when, when you look, in fact, at the same national ar so-called national armies, that is a very big word, at least until the France of Louis XIV, um, such, in fact, national forces remained... Um, quite um, quite a very mixed bag. The so-called Spanish armies, for example, did contain, of course, a few Spaniards, but also Italians, Burgundians, Walloons, Germans, and Swiss, and soldiers hired on a temporary basis remained, of course, very important.
right? And again, when you see the difference, think about the tertia. The tertia was essentially a, a voluntary force, right? Apparently, there wasn't, at least this was their, the, 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 the pride of, of the Spanish in the sense that the fact that there wasn't really any discipline required uh, for example, dispensing of deserters, because, you know, abandoning the tertia was considered, you know, the greatest punishment and infamy and, and, and mark of misfortune that could ever happen to a man. So, you, you understand that well, these were kind of, um, as you know, provincial regiments that they were, as we were saying before, properly recruited in various areas of, of the Spanish dominions. And they bore, in fact, the name of the local troops, but they were mixed as well, right? I don't know, I don't know, the Tertio Sardinia could be made up of Sardinians at a point, but I don't know, then eventually integrated with, I don't know, the, the, the Lombards or the Swiss or, or the Germans. And, and they would be quite mixed and just fighting at a point for just not even for a specific political fate, but just because, you know, having a job and an income in spite of all the the risks of war was very often for most for many people for many dispossessed people at the time actually a much better living than than uh, than whatever they did at home and very often th these veterans would come home and really poorer than than before but at least they they survived and they lived as uh, as free people at the end of the day maybe these people were serfs and you know, it, w it was still a better thing, and and still, having been a soldier could uh, present them always with with further job opportunities. Because, <laughs> as you understand, Europe was was constantly fighting, so you were never over if you really uh, were up to it. Um, so, there are exceptions to this mercenary bias but only in those countries that had kind of a lower military activity at home in general. If you pick England, for example, aside from the, uh, the intrepid uh, exploration deeds in the Americas against the Spanish, the, the French, etc., well, essentially, the, the local army was a militia system, right? And the thing was not changed until... Um, until basically the English Civil War, and actually the Stuarts were were trying to to put England at the same levels of other countries, and and even though they were overthrown, what what England was later was exactly this, you know, paying actually an overwhelmingly larger amount of money for for maintaining in fact uh, an army, really that at the end of the 17th century was really worth this name. Um, uh, starting also from Cromwell, uh, as you understand, also in, with interruptions, right? But some, a much larger expense than any ship money for which eventually the parliament had been shut down and, you know, the civil war triggered and all. So uh, th this was necessary for a country that wanted to have, in fact, a role in the world. And this dynamic is, in fact, the one for which England became the greatest world power. In fact, later on, you do really need a real army to be a real power, which someone should really understand what it means <laughs> in, in perspective. And any reference is purely, you know, conjectural, uh, co related to current times. Um, now, um, the... The same was true. This was true in general for northern countries that weren't particularly developed at all. For example, Sweden, that can, comes to, to military glory and to the empire uh, during the 17th century, well, was a pretty underdeveloped country in that moment. It had attempted to establish a national conscript army in the 1560s, though, like later attempts of the same type, this had limited success. As you know, basically, the, the Swedish army uh, of Gustavus Adolphus was, was a, a French financial creation. 
uh, and um, but that was still a beginning and still again you, you do need an army to do things and, and let's say countries that come later sometimes or at least have a more sudden expansion sometimes are also uh, also often have benefits this is evident in technology right uh, very often more advanced countries have greater resistance to implementing newer models because they have already some a structure going on that is, is difficult to integrate with the novelty is that if you didn't have anything previously you can in a sense invest more directly in something more orderly since the beginning of course Sweden worked a lot in that sense um, it was advantaged by her exports at some point but it was an enormous work right politically and socially behind that too and so none of this of course didn't come at a cost but again that's the reason why having a functional army really brings you the benefits uh, more clearly and um, and that's really what the enemy is seeking right if you have an army that doesn't stand on its feet you know at a point it would be even better if you didn't start wars in the first place any other reference repeated reference to current events is purely you know random um, when you look at the Ottomans for example well this was basically the only power um, really in the world at the time to be provided with a large regular standing army right and we're not talking generally speaking about the entirety of the Ottoman army but its core right uh, given that even in fact the, the port had its own army in Constantinople but then as we've seen recently also with the Timariotes etc about the, the bulk of the forces was um, numerically but also you know the size of the element was this kind of semi-feudal um, and uh, system like with land held on a non-hereditary basis on a regional scale uh, of uh, in fact, it was spread mostly Anatolia and Romania because those were the, the core lands of the empire. Then there were lots of auxiliaries, allies, as we've seen. So this kind of mix, uh, this semi-feudal system at this point existed. Uh, it was the norm, in fact, also in, in less strictly statalized countries. I mean, the Ottoman Empire was was powerful also because it had, a, of course, it had dramatic political strategic advantages in its posi position, whatever. It, it was a young power. It had a lot of force. It had been able to exploit lots of, you know, weakness in, in the area for, for its expansion. But it also wasn't developing really in a Western sense, right? Uh, with uh, a really a modern state as we intended. So it remained very powerful for a long time. But at the same time, at the early in the early 18th century, it was evident that that kind of uh, still, in fact, feudal, semi-feudal system was not as effective as what Western powers were rise, rising like uh, against what Western powers were rising like in a more permanent national sense professional sense of the entire army etc so this semi-feudal system prevailed actually throughout all the early modern age if you look at Europe since the beginning and then towards the end it largely uh, especially outside of of Western Europe like in fact in Russia the Ottoman Empire but even up to the eastern borders of Austria right in other eastern areas that's that that's where step really begins right so the that's why also the modern age defines really what is narrowly Western and what is you know if you, even if you look at Germany there you, you have a you know it takes uh, a long time you see Austria and Prussia paradoxically shift their power east because again, it, they they would have been freer from kind of that feudal labyrinth that Germany really was, but of course Germany doesn't quite develop before also the the end of the Thirty Years' War some kind of basis for really that permanent um, local force that can eventually expand in a statal sense, um, and eastwards everything is much more privatized, right? Much uh, less, much more feudal still. And that's why ultimately countries like um, 
like even why Poland collapsed on the long run is because it, it, the Schlachter had prevented for, for centralization. And so at a point by the 18th century to become Russian vassals. Um, but Russia, as you know, had huge difficulties as well. It just was a very big country, and so it could field um, loss of resources. Um, but, you know, qualitatively speaking, there was a gap with the West. It was maintained importantly, and that you can see even up to today, really, because you can have contingental success very rarely, telling the truth. Um, the A day is probably the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, but in and there, it's very often also quantity has a relevance, but uh, not necessarily to, you know, in a broader civilizational sense to, to make a difference in the long run. So that's why where you have to look at the political and social issues before the strictly military phase, or at least just looking at it. Uh, and as we were saying before, even countries like Austria or Prussia, even in their more kind of Western core, really could produce uh, like a statal army, say like France. Um, and that's was what we mostly discussed in all the political, diplomatic, financial difficulties in that series about Vienna 1683. And that shows you exactly how much military threat triggered that kind of statal development, statal boosting, right? And the, the picture there was quite clear, right? France invading the empire, the Rhineland, uh, even if, you know, the Netherlands had factually seceded from, from the empire, you know, that's still the risk in that all Europe had to coalize against France and, and the Ottomans naturally were allied with France in the process. So uh, how couldn't this produce eventually a historically a Montecuccoli or a Prince Eugene, right? And the same goes for all the gr great names of military commanders that throughout all the time that kind of went from antiquity to, to this point had, were, were really obscured, right? And the reason is that not that there weren't Napoleons or Hannibals in the Middle Ages, it's that they, they didn't have uh, the means properly from a military point of view to to carry out uh, those um, you know those masterpieces that really greater means in fact provide to you with the possibility of enacting when you have uh, when you're tested right so um, that's why also we should really understand much better also medieval warfare or early modern warfare on the grounds of these limits and, and really realizing what th these meant in relative in absolute terms for us to for example being less interested in them but again it, it's already a lot of anyone is interested in military history today in these circumstances the basic administrative unit of all armies as we've seen is the company Right, and still today, it's it's really um, uh, at least a, a level of organic that still maintains that universal human connection. Like the officer in command of a company is the one who actually knows all the all the elements of the company, and therefore has a, a dramatic tactical um, role, differently from the others that uh, rule from from another position, really order from another command from another position. And originally the the the, the captain contractor and the mercenaries raised by him were the company. In fact, companies were of widely varying size and were not generally tactical units per se at least in the way, as we've seen very often, also recently on early modern infantry, because I made yet another bit about that, that how we were partially repeated, how these units really blended from an organic point of view. So there is still an equivalent of the company in that universal human sense that forms and that has that tactical autonomy. In fact, several companies would be united 
originally in an ad hoc manner upon the battlefield, to form a larger battle group. And the larger groupings gradually became more permanent right in the early 16th century, and also large tactical units arose. For example, the Spanish Tercios, that were regiments, practically, the French legions, at least this attempt that Francis I made to create a native French infantry, um, in fact, regimental unit and that basically served to nothing. They kept using the Swiss for a long time. I, ma I made a video about this topic, specifically about the French native infantry, native French infantry of the um, of the Italian wars, and it's often an overlooked topic. Shows you all the French political and social issues regarding arming the people, which for a feudal aristocratic society was quite dangerous, in fact. And, and the regiment, as you know, would remain uh, throughout the period and beyond with considerable success, this kind of broader base, also what really the, the core and uh, the identity, the esprit de corps of, of, the, of the unit, really, of, of, of the soldiers would really lay. And, and uh, these were regularly depleted right, under strength. So that's the reason why they had this tactical role at a point. Uh, because even, not even the, the regiments very often were enough to have that kind of capacity. And so the, the, the battle would, um, would have that specific role. Um, in fact, rather smaller regiments often created temporarily for a single operation or campaign were also used um, for example, England did this, uh, and late in the 16th century, battalions of 500 men or so, modeled originally on the Roman cohort, at least according to the to the classical um, classical philia, that however had nothing to do with with military reality. In that sense, were introduced to give um, greater flexibility in a regiment or brigade comprise several of such uh, so-called battalions. Right? Earlier the word battalion had a, been applied to the large medieval style battle, in fact. And so that's where it took its name from. It was kind of a implementation, let's say, of the older concept of a single tactical autonomous unit. And as well as the sort of development that was in the period, also a gradual change in the proportion of shock to missile weapons, notoriously enough within the same infantry formations, and both were necessary, since no missile troop of the period, we explained, could stop um, cavalry charge, but on, not even infantry. Uh, by their by their fire. Uh, nor was essentially a way um, they they could stand up cavalry once they reached close quarters. In the first place, they were not meant to do so. Cavalry r had remained important throughout the period, um, continuously. They were saying before, and a bit at the beginning of the period, pikes, and supported by shot and relying upon close quarter combat alone um, were not unknown, right? Only, for example, one sixteenth of the original Landsknecht were shot. But the proportion of missile men steadily grew. By the 80s of the 16th century, it would usually form about half the total. So quite um, a gradual process after all. And it is fair to say that at least in most tactical situations, so mostly non pitch battles as we've seen, that the pikes were really supporting the shot rather than the other way around. Right? Uh, of course they were still uh, largely uh, in the size of, especially at, at this point, but say by the second quarter of the 17th century, two shot to one pikeman was considered ideal, for example. It was not always attain in practice. Gustavus Adolphus, um, for example, favored a larger proportion of pikes, the two to three, uh, 
on paper at least, but when you realize also what the Swedish army felt like in, in Germany, you realize that um, the the pike was also properly abandoned by by the soldiers who would do anything to get a gun in the process. Also on the uh, battlefields of the English Civil War that were pretty much, as you know, also um, characterized by edges and other obstacles, uh, the shots came to be somewhat prevalent you know, as, as a kind of sort of skirmishing um, guerrilla type. So it's obvious, for example, in the English case that were lots of battles were fought, but they were not, say, as big say like the the ones of the 30 years war on average right so you realize that in those contexts the the say the more more mobile element was favored also because the terrain made uh, a bigger difference whereas for pitch battles for larger battles you normally have to pick also a field and that is adequate and that facilitates in that sense larger formations and so that sense pike blocks could be more easily deployed in the first place so there is also that thing but you realize that from the beginning of the period where again the Swiss had basically created a, a mono arm system that had made the difference just because it was professional right so had that degree of collective training to make the difference even though it was just a, a mono arm one but the Battle of Marignano showed how that was also obsolete as a concept, and that's why the properly the combined arms pike and shot system um, came around and standardized eventually in Europe. Because again, the Swiss had somewhat uh, economized on that. Right? Would they they were using that system um, in in because it, it largely reflected their politics and society. They were not a feudal power. So they, they would have had this much greater kind of um, f force of mountaineers that were, however, rigidly trained, like by a cantonal government in cooperation, together with the entirety of Switzerland, right? So also, actually, lots of people under a single government, a cooperative one, a decisive one. That's You see there how political cohesion makes a difference, right? Uh, but on the long run, of course, while other states were even emulating the Swiss, we've just seen what the Imperial Army, like with the Landsknecht, had done. But uh, later on, the same French that used the Swiss, but as inter an integrated force, together with their magnificent cavalry and artillery. Um, and the Spanish, eventually, with the pike and shot, and even the Rodelleros, right, this kind of assault troops, really prevail. But the latter would actually decline. Not so fast though right there was always kind of an assault unit type in in all pike and shot warfare right to also to break into the enemy pikes uh, or pike formation at least um and that's an interesting side of the story but um it was um everything had gradually followed but to say the an the 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 combined arms system had definitely uh, improved immediately with this necessity of the arms support multiple arms supporting each other and as you know there was also a lot of attempts before really understanding what kind of direction this thing would would go in terms of pike and shot relation and um, in addition there were in fact throughout all the period units composed of missile men only for example the, uh, albeit, you know, we are looking particularly to, to the east, where support for cavalry remained the prime function of infantry, and foot were not really expected to withstand horse, except with the aid of field defenses of some kind. This is typical of Ottoman, Ottoman forces, right? Um, they had, a, again, they, had a, they didn't have really a robust bike force. They had assault forces, but in defense they had to entrench themselves because they didn't have much of an other system to, to cope with. It was as if they, they had in, uh, substituted the pikemen in that way for the rest defending with fire, power, and uh, melee like when the cavalry would arrive into the, in the entrenchments. Um, so 
that's how they cope with that. But let's say even if you look at, at Eastern Europe in general, you you see of course that uh, everything was kind of uh, uh, more frequent. The 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 Polish troops, the Cossacks, the dragons, this this um, things, uh, they they were very often mounted, dismounted infantry, and they were shot essentially, or you know they could enter melee but not as solid pike blocks right and that's was that wasn't in fact much of a mostly the poles hired german mercenaries for that a bit like it was done for the swiss before um while as we've seen the west fundamentally mostly france spain italy germany had the most integrated kind of a multi-arm system there already laid out right uh standardly but also in the west there were actually units composed of missile men only they were not very common indeed and it were likely to be formed temporarily for particular purposes um groups of arquebusiers or musketeers were often detached that is literally commanded in the in the world of the time to support uh cavalry or to form a skirmish line or foreland, for example. This is really normal because, um, say, for example, in every defeat, right, there is always um, a unit that sacrifices itself for the others to, to, to gain time, the hell out of the way quickly. So you understand, as we were saying before, in, I don't know, think about the edges in the English countryside, and there would be interesting layers of this kind of. Uh, troops kind of forming different lines of defense just with shots right consider the pikes are cumbersome so they can't they, they also have infantry uh, with rows more slowly from, from from the battlefield if it wants to retain cohesion otherwise you throw away everything but that's a full route but you have even at battle uh, like for example at the battle of Auerstedt, just you know in Napoleonic times you know that when the Prussians are defeated, was a, a, a Saxon battalion that retreated in in square and and managed actually to to do so safely and in that formation to f that was very slow, of course, as the square is, but fencing off the uh, the French um, the French cavalry at that point that were pursuing them. So. That that is still an interesting example of that, and, and these things would happen normally also during the the pike and shot. Here it would happen actually many time, but just for saying that, uh, think about I don't know very wild terrains in areas where also infantry, as we've seen, was lighter on average, or at least uh, there were enemies like the Ottomans that were lighter in that sense. Well, I don't know in the Transylvanian. Um, mountains and forests like it would have been quite easy to form to, to have an elastic defense and to retreat by skirmishing with arquebuses or muskets uh, against uh, an advancing enemy because with, with, with a difficult ground it really can do that as well as we've seen the same Ottomans had pretty good snipers because aside from siege warfare probably they, they also got this kind of more uh, wild kind of hunting you know background from 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 local peoples of the internal think about the Balkans I mean and, and, and most Ottoman armies were made up of very large proportions of Serbs of Bulgarians of etc and uh, those peoples knew how to skirmish and to they were masters in that kind of war. Of course, their organization was like that because they didn't have a punching force in open field, but that reflected naturally their own politics and society. Um, but what, in, what, what I'm saying that is that these aspects do account for something. For example, I don't know, during World War I, there was a minimal impact in the broader scale of things that was made, say, by the, the, the spread of let's say, life customs or also uh, sport, in traditional sports made in different countries, right? There were better snipers at the beginning of the war somewhere initially to create 
even ad hoc units before eventually the war blended everything in depending on whether you know in your country in fact hunting was a greater um you know sport than than in another country um so given how okay, the overwhelming majority of the people at the time were peasants well generally speaking they knew how to handle a gun other weapons even even bows as we've seen effectively right you it's not they are going to be these are just militias they will melt away immediately in open field against mercenary i mean professional forces in the first place but again in the in the broader strategic theater well you can harass the enemy with them quite effectively and make some some consistent damage overall right so these are all aspects that one would like to look at better in depth we will talk in other videos separately about things like drill and frontages or infantry shock weapons uh, such as you know the pike staff weapons the infantry sword even the infantry shields that were actually a thing even in metals uh, during the even up to the mid 16th century or beyond right yes they they used them against fire um, they and they worked right uh, just at some point they became obsolete because they, it would have costed too much or would have become too cumbersome and it wouldn't stop um, fire because of the improvement of our, uh, of um, firearms technology but infantry missile weapons even the longbow at some point were theorized as being still even during you know before the civil war during it there were some English uh, in England I mean talking about there, there are some treatises speaking of the advantages of the longbow naturally at that time it had become really obsolete and in fact we don't really find much of that really being used concretely to, to make a difference but it, it was still there right think about the composite bow in the step like um, Turkish infantry would use this normally even up to the, the 80s of the 17th century the crossbow which we mentioned it went on up to the second half of the 16th century in some significant manner and then of course we can't talk about the archibus the musket the formation of firing and all these things that are very important however for today I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in, interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye